Welcome to Longmont Public Media's Conversation with the Candidates. I'm Richard Lyons, and I'm here today with Tim Waters, one of three candidates for the position of mayor of the city of Longmont. Welcome, Tim. Richard, thank you. Now can I call you Dick? Yes, you okay. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to be here. Good. Um, Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself so Longmont can ha get to know you better. Uh, well, some people may not want to get to know me better, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, when Phoenix was just a spot in the desert. Uh, I, I spent my formative years there, graduated from high school, came to the University of Denver as an undergraduate student. The only reason I got to DU is because I could shoot a jump shot and then realized almost immediately that I was like a step slow and four inches sh short on my vertical. <laughs> I needed to get an education because basketball wasn't going to be my future. Uh, but I graduated from DU in four years. I met my bride, uh, who, who now we've been married for 50 years. We celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary this summer at school at DU. Um, we got married in Phoenix, started my career there. I spent uh, 15 years in the Glendale High School District. I did about everything one can do in a school district from teaching to a discipline officer, assistant principal, high school principal, assistant superintendent. My last year in Arizona, I worked for the governor as his policy, education policy advisor, Bruce Babbitt. Uh, just before he was, as he was running for president, uh, before he went into the Clinton administration. Finished a doctorate at Arizona State University that year, and then took a, a job as superintendent of schools in Greeley. I was in Greeley for seven years, 86 to 93, then was recruited to, uh, to go to work for an education research development and service uh -huh. company. I spent the next 21 years of my career there. I was 23 years in the field, 21 years at uh, what was McCrell, uh, it started, we, when I got there, it was the Mid-Continent Regional Education Laboratory. Regional Education Laboratory. When I left, we were McCrell International. We had grown to in, substantially during that period of time. We had offices in, in Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii, and Melbourne, Australia, wow. as well as across the country by the time I left. Hmm. Um, so 44 years plus in the field of education. We, uh, my wife and I moved to Longmont in 1994 with our two sons. Uh, one of whom now is uh, an attorney in Tulsa, and one lives in Arvada with our daughter-in-law and two beautiful granddaughters. Uh, he builds voice and data infrastructure for Piper Communications. Hmm. So there you go. What, what else would you like to know? <laughs> well, that brings us to the next question. What, what then brought you to Longmont? Yeah. Um, when, I, when I left Greeley, as the, that, that job in, in Greeley uh, as superintendent, and took the job with the organization I went to, uh, it's located in the tech center. Uh, Janie was teaching in Loveland. So it's like, where are we going to locate? I was serving at the time on the Colorado Commission on Higher Education. I'd been appointed by Roy Romer, and I served a couple of terms on, the, on CCHE, representing the 4th Congressional District. And so we were looking for a, an opportunity to find a place that was in the 4th that could keep Janie working where she was. And, you know, as one thing led to another... Uh, during that house search, uh, the governor, there was an opening for an at-large position on CCHE. The governor had pointed me to that, mm. which opened up some options. My sister and brother-in-law had moved to Longmont. Uh, the city manager and his family had been lifelong, or lifelong, decades-long friends. Um, everything we knew about Longmont drew us to Longmont. The interesting part of that story is, most interesting, is when I got to Greeley as superintendent of schools, the only person in town with a bigger profile than mine was a guy named Tad Boyle, oh. right? <laughs> and he had been, he'd, he'd graduated from high school five years earlier, right? He graduated yeah. in 1981, I think. I got there in 86. But everywhere I went, I heard about Tad Boyle, the schoolboy legend, right? Basketball yeah. star. So when the time came to move, my younger son, bat, playing basketball, Tad Boyle was a high school basketball yes, coach. Yes, I remember. So it's like, are you kidding me? We can move to Longmont. Everything else had kind of cleared up, and my son could play for Tad. There you go. So we looked and looked and looked for a house in the Longmont High School attendance area. Then, kind of like now, not much on the housing market, right? Mm -hmm. We finally found a house. The day we closed on that house, Tad Boyle announced he was leaving coaching <laughs> and, and moving to the Northwest to do financial planning. Uh, and then, you know, as, as the story goes, he came back into coaching and obviously been at CU for a while. I had a chance to share that story with Tad uh, oh, once upon a time to say, totally you don't know it, but you and I have a history together. So <laughs> anyway, um, that's what brought us to Longmont. That brought you along. Yeah, we weren't here very long before we, did, we knew this was the last stop. There were this, we fell in love with Longmont. 
there was not going to be any place else for us. Well, good. That leads into the next question. Um, what one thing do you uh, want the Longmont voters to know about you? Um, the one thing. Um, Just one. Yeah. I, the, uh, for me, uh, my, my adult life has been dedicated really to service. In, you know, I've been in service roles to those, who, I think, who, who need the kind of things that I could bring. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and that's been... I've never not. I've never been good at retirement. I mean, I've, I've continued to do this in retirement, and I guess that's it. I, my what motivates me more than anything in life is to feel like somehow I'm out there making a difference. Oh, that's great. So, what do you especially like and don't like about Longmont? Hmm. Um, <laughs> there's so much to like. Uh, I mean, I, there's so much to like from the diversity of this community, the pace of the community the talent in the community. Uh, while I think we have a lot to do, a lot more work to do with amenitizing the community. Mm -hmm. If you think about our greenways and our parks and, you know, that part, that, that, how that part of the community has been amenitized. Uh, the values that you see showing up, the connections downtown and across the community from the business community. It's just there's so much to like. Uh, the levels of involvement and engagement from one end of town and from one sector uh, to another. Mm -hmm. I, if there was anything right now, given my what I've done as a member of city council and some of the issues we deal with, if there was the one thing that concerns me maybe more than any is the number. And I, I'm, what I'm about to say, I know there are going to some people who will react to this as a as a shaming or as a, a pejorative kind of statement. It's just what happens is there are there are too many times in my mind right now when the old the whole idea of not in my backyard mm -hmm. shows up. Yeah on issues that are really important to the future of the community, housing in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so without even kind of unpacking what a, a proposal is and what the benefits as well as the costs are, there are times where that shows up too quickly in my opinion. Quickly. Yeah. So let's give you a hypothetical. You've been on city council now as um, a member uh, uh, from Ward 1. Uh, if the city received a million dollar grant to use in any way, shape, or form that the council determined, what would you do with it and why? <laughs> uh, this, honestly, that, it's easy for me. Um, right now, uh, I'm, I'm heavily, deeply involved as a council member in uh, one of the goals we set as a council to, to do more and better for our youngest residents. Um, so we have an early childhood, child care, mm -hmm. early learning initiative. Around that initiative, a coalition of providers of, of just interested parties have kind of come together as a loosely knit or coupled group. Um, this, the whole effort for me has been part of my professional experience, you know, forever. Uh, but if we're going to um, when we first started with this whole initiative, it was with the thought in mind that our youngest, our, the, the moms and dads and those kids need more from us than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and personally, the work I was doing before I retired, we were, we were seriously involved in a, uh, a world-class evidence-based uh, early childhood initiative, all of which was focused on getting children to be school ready. That if we had kids school ready, and we had kid-ready schools, then all those gaps we worked so hard to overcome in the K-12 system, much of that is resolved before they ever step into a classroom. Mm -hmm. Life choices become very different for kids who are school-ready. And to get them all there, we, we knew when we started this, we probably had 550 kids every day who we couldn't account for, who were nowhere that might be preparing them to be school-ready. We just didn't know. But... Um, we have made progress on this initiative as a, as a community, as a city, uh, and not just as a council initiative, but it's really aligned with the council initiative. But we have so much more work to do. And I have to say, if we could get this right, uh, recovering from an economic or from a, a, a pandemic mm -hmm. and the economic recovery required to do that is, is, is dependent to a large degree on our ability to get this solved. Uh, if we want to see a stable workforce, working moms and dads who want to be back in the workforce, back in the workforce, we got to do better with our early childhood initiative. Uh, long term, if you think about economic development efforts, uh, if you think about 
all of the things, uh, the, the life indicators that are, that are connected to uh -huh. high quality early learning experiences. Long term, we solve our homelessness problem. We solve our economic development problems. I mean, over the course of a generation, if we could get it right with our youngest kids. So if I had a million bucks. That's where you'd spend it. I'd spend it right there. Very good. So, Tim, did, did you have uh, one person that was your mentor or that was very influential in your life? Hmm. And if so, how, how well, did that person influence yeah, it would be, it would Well, <laughs> both my mother and my father. Would, I, I don't know that I could sort one from the other. I got so much from each of them. Professionally, I know I've stood on the shoulders of my father, you know, from the time I was a young man. My entire professional life, he was, the, he was iconic for me. Okay. Very good. And so, follow up, are you paying it forward? Are you mentoring or yeah. helping someone? And is that person someday will say <laughs> you were their mentor or influenced you? I hope so. I... Um, here, you know, people can believe this or not. I mean, it, we're here. It's you and I having this conversation. Somebody's going to watch and go, "He's so full of it." But um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I have uh, I've had the good fortune of leading organizations um, much of my professional life. Uh, even when I was a high school principal, you're you're kind of running your show there. You know, you report yeah. to a superintendent, all that kind of stuff. But as a superintendent and then as a CEO, um, I've had a chance to to bring people together as a leader of organizations that focused on developing leaders. Part, that was part of our mission. And, um, and I don't know how many times I've had conversations with folks about, here's the way it works. I stand on the shoulders of giants, not much as my dad. There's a, you know, I could go mm -hmm. down a list. Uh, part of my job, to be the shoulders upon which the next generation can stand and your jobs, right, as a team, are to do the same. That's what we do. It's, it's one generation preparing the next to ascend. And then we, what we bring together across generations adds value, right, across time and space in ways that only happens when you yeah. approach it that way. Absolutely. So, Tim, Colorado and Longmont have lots of recreational uh, opportunities. Which do you enjoy and how do you uh, spend your leisure time? <laughs> well, uh, most people, some people might say, he fancies himself a golf professional with a negative cash flow, right? <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I love to play golf, uh, but Janie and I walk and we bike. We used to ski uh, until I had three knee replacements and, and I wore yeah. one of them out too quickly uh, on the ski slopes. So I can't run anymore, um, but uh, we, we enjoy walking and I, I love being on the golf course and we love being on our bicycles, so. Good. Good. And if there's ever a place to live, and enjoy bike paths. <laughs> it's in Longmont, Colorado. That's true. So, so um, it looks like Longmont, from the latest maps of the um, congressional redistricting, is going to be switched from the fourth congressional district to the second congressional district. What impact, if any, do you think that will have on the city of Longmont? <clears throat> well, as I understand, um, uh, what I think to be the demographics that have changed in Longmont over time. And as I understand how we ended up in the fourth congressional district 10 years ago. Uh, so this is, I've received this second hand, but from 10 years ago or 10 years ago, Longmont was, the demographics were more conservative, uh, more Republican-like mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And it's my understanding that in the redistricting then, there was a deal that was made among those who were making decisions about redistricting to put Longmont in the fourth, which was more reflective of the, dem the politics of the fourth to keep Fort Collins and Larimer County in the second. Um, so now you have a safe second and a safe fourth. Over the 10 year period of time, the demographics have changed here and the politics have changed here. So it's far less red or far less like the rest of the fourth and way more like the rest of the second. So I think in terms of uh, Longmonters, at least those Longmonters who would like to be represented by Joe Nagus or, you know, assuming Joe continues or somebody like Joe, um, it would be a pretty good match with a majority of Longmonters. Uh, and it probably, for whoever represents the fourth, today a Ken Buck, would be just as happy to see Longmont leave the fourth and back to the second. <laughs> right. But I do think for, for Longmonters, there's a greater affiliation with the current demographics and the politics of the second and who represents the second in Congress. Okay. So, Tim, how do you learn and stay informed about local, state, and national issues? 
Um, well, I try to hang out with people like you, right? <laughs> uh, honestly, I, you know, if you get a chance, if you have a chance to spend time with smart people, you learn a lot if you're just willing to listen. And as, as much as I talk, people would say, when do you have time to listen? As much as you talk. But I do, I, I do enjoy uh, the opportunity to learn from others. And, I, and I've learned from you and, I, and I've learned from on this job or in this role as a council member, I have learned so much from the people whose paths I've crossed, whether it's city staff or citizens or, you mm -hmm. know, people with ideas. Uh, that's always, for me, it's always been probably, I'm a, I'm a pretty auditory learner, but I do a lot of reading anyway. anyway. You know, it, you're, you can't, you're surrounded by streams of media today that you, it's inescapable, even yeah. if you, you know, didn't want to be, have, have information washing over you. Making meaning of that, right, is the challenge. Yeah. You know? um, uh, so I'm a, I'm a, I have a voracious appetite for learning in, in, in multiple ways. I do a lot of reading. You can't be on council without doing a lot of reading. And I, I really enjoy being in the, in the company of smart people. Oh, okay. So national politics are very divisive in our federal and state governments. Although the city council is nonpartisan, some say it's becoming more political. What would you do to keep that divisiveness from occurring in Longmont City Council? Yeah. Um, now, I, first of all, I have an answer. <laughs> I wish it was as simple as what I'm about to say, because once you put people in the loop, a human in the loop diminishes reliability pretty quickly. But um, when, when we were, in my opinion, in the years I've been on council, uh, we were... We was a moment when I think we were at our best. And it was when we had a, we'd come out of a planning retreat that actually became a goal-setting retreat. I, when I went into it, I wasn't certain exactly what, what it was going to be. I'd been elected in February, late February. This is in May of 2018. We came out of a retreat with two pretty bold, compelling, in, in my view, very attractive vision statements for the future of Longmont. And we'd agreed on seven goals to align with these vision statements. That if we, if we could make progress on these seven goals, the prospect of realizing the, that the vision, the two vision statements, uh, would be enhanced. Uh, we went from that retreat <clears throat> to the fall of 2018, and we, it took us that long to finally adopt the goals. And we put together a work plan, kind of. Um, uh, there was a lot more in it than just what would be required to achieve these goals. But the conversation with the council at that time was, um, who wants to lead on these? Uh, who's willing to put their hand up and say, I'll take the lead on that one and you know, kind of others fall mm -hmm. in or, or coalesce around that person's leadership. And so in that, in that conversation, uh, several people raised their hands. We agreed that who was gonna take leadership on these initiatives. And for a moment, it's like, hey, we're all heading the same direction. And we've, we've acknowledged who's gonna lead on what. And I'm willing to fall in behind that person's leadership, trust them. Um, and then what happens over time, and unfortunately, I don't, that wasn't enough time, I wish it had lasted longer, that uh, when policy differences emerge, in, whether it's around those goals or something else, what happens, it happened to us, I think it happens to other groups of elected officials, um, uh, a difference on policy turns into a personal issue. There's personal animus or resentment that you don't agree with me on this policy, or you didn't listen enough to me on this policy, or you don't understand the implications of this policy. Therefore, you know, there's some personal issue that emerges. And I, uh, for me, that's, that should be unworthy of us as elected officials. I, I spent my professional life kind of the nexus of leadership, research, and policy, and we kept encouraging policymakers to, to transcend that stuff, yeah. to look at the evidence, to connect it with your aspirations. So short answer to a long answer to your question, but the, the, the net of that is, I hope the next council gets really clear, not just on the goals, but the objectives we're gonna accomplish this year together. And what does it take from us together to accomplish that? So when an idea comes along, that might be a great idea, but that doesn't advance us towards, the, towards a, a, an objective, we have a chance to have a different conversation. Like, mm -hmm. to what degree this, <laughs> is this aligned or not? Are we going to take something off the table or are we going to somehow add this because it adds value to what we're trying, what we said we want to get accomplished together? But we've kind of lost sight of what the, what the objectives were that we need yeah. to accomplish. And that, I think, is the basis for getting 
divided too many times and in too okay. many ways. Okay, very good. So how do you plan on involving residents in the decision-making or m getting them more involved in the decision-making in the city? Um, well, f I'd say first of all, <clears throat> if anybody watches city council me meetings, um, if there's a camera like that, so when I would say, the most fun of serving on city council is not Tuesday nights. Right? <laughs> it's what happens the other six days of the week. And, um, and the other six days of the week is when you get a chance to get involved with, with folks. If it's constituent work. You're hearing uh -huh. from people about whatever their problem is, trying to help. It's the opportunity to do the early childhood coalition work we've been doing or the visioning process that um, I had a chance to play a leadership role with Harold uh, Dominguez in what became the Building STEAM initiative and facilitating that process. That happens other days of the week, and th those are ways to get the community involved. The people care about what we're doing with early childhood or care about uh, a more vision-driven mm -hmm. or vision-based approach to planning, right? You have to comply with ordinances. You have to comply with zoning. But we ought to be sending really clear signals to developers and investors on what we want to see as proposals. And here's the vision that we've, not the only vision, yeah. but a vision. So um, beyond that, Dick, I think um, there are so many times in my, in my mind when we're in a conversation on a Tuesday night and the potential would be to say, you know what, um, uh, let's continue this on Saturday morning or let's con continue this uh, uh, Sunday afternoon or let's get some space and let's, let's have a conversation. It'll have to be a council meeting because we're going to have at least council, four council members involved, uh, but let's facilitate it a little bit differently so we can actually talk and listen to one another. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the frustrations. Public invited to be heard. There are protocol is people have come and speak. They ask questions. We, we keep, don't get the answer uh, other than during open forums. And it just kind of it becomes a really awkward, odd kind of stilted uh, mm -hmm. setting. I think we ought to be willing and, and um, enthusiastic about all the places we might have a chance to continue the conversation. You know? Okay, Very good. So. This one should be easy for you to answer. If you change, if you could change one thing in the current municipal code, what would that be? Um, well, without a doubt, right now, just one thing. Just oh, one gosh. thing. I think I'd, I'd, uh, I would want to. We have conflicts right now in our municipal code between design standards and our inclusionary housing ordinance, and the that the the. The conflict in those standards or the conflict in those ordinances uh, create confusion and um, add a burden of time to approving projects that are good ideas. And not every project's a good idea, but the ones that are good ones oftentimes get caught up. For, I'm talking up for housing issues. Mm -hmm. And every day that we add to the approval process for a propo on a proposal adds cost to a home the whoever's going to buy a home. Uh -huh. We need to pick up the pace on that process. And one of the ways to do it would be reconciling the differences, differences. between design standards and the inclusionary housing ordinance. Very good. So um, that leads us to the final, and you alluded to it, question. Um, between affordable housing and attainable housing, which do you personally prioritize as being the greater need for the city? Hmm. Well, uh, I'm going to say attainable housing, and, and, and it, I, I could laugh at myself even for giving that answer. I just think we've done a better job in signaling to the development community what we want to see. We've set a clear goal. Our protocols are pretty clear. I think we've been less clear on um, both the need for attainable housing. We have not set a target for it, a goal as a council. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. We should have done that a long time ago. And, um, and, and explored every single option for working with those who could produce that kind of product on what we, what, what we might do to mm -hmm. increase the probability that we could get market rate housing that working families could qualify for and afford you know, the total cost of home ownership. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, Tim, we've run out of questions. I've enjoyed uh, this conversation. And I wish you luck in your campaign. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank Thanks you. for what you're doing, by the way, with oh, this, with this process. Thank you.